Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. All right, NBA playoffs in full swing. Jason Timp, host of Hoops Tonight, is joining us. You know, I was watching the T-Wolves and Nuggets, and um, I, I thought this would be a very long series. I said six or seven, I'll take Denver. But I was watching Charles Barkley after, and his interpretation was sort of mine, which is you watched these guys play. Um, Minnesota's bigger, Minnesota's deeper, and there was clearly an athletic advantage. They're just, they're more athletic. They're, they, I mean, and some of that's ant, maybe a large part of it's ant, but Jokic isn't highly athletic what you would call dynamic. He's just a great basketball player. Jamal Murray, again, he never made an all-star team. I wouldn't call him dynamic. He's a shot maker. Uh, Michael Porter is, Gordon is just a relentless energy guy. But when I watched that series, and I don't want to overreact, but I was like, oh, they can throw a lot of bodies at Denver. A lot of bodies. They, they go about eight deep. You know, there's not much of a Denver bench. And my take is, it's hard to win when they're deeper, they're more athletic. And and part of this is, and I said this um, about two weeks ago, I said, it's an inflection point for Ant Edwards. Is he going to become Dominique, spectacular, but can't get through these profoundly deep teams, no titles, and we just have great highlights, or Jordan, that you got to win two to three or four, and it's like, no, this is the face of the league. And Wemby and Ant feel like those are the two guys that should be the face of the league. So this series, to me, it's a lot bigger than people think. It's not just, well, Ant goes down. It's like Denver may have a bench at some point. You know, like this Denver team, you beat them now, they'll probably have to react to you. Also, if Minnesota loses, they may not keep Carl Anthony Towns. So this Twin Towers thing, although it's worked, it may be more experimental if they got doused in five games in this series. So I feel like, I'm watching this in fascinating inflection point with Ant as he is now, if, if they get to the finals, they match up very well with Boston. You're like, is this Jordan's first title? Am I overreacting to it? No, not at all. I mean, Ant's been the best player in the playoffs so far. He's yes. literally been the best guy. No question. He's been the best. No he, he, he soundly outplayed Nikola Jokic last night. But it, it like it, it, the it's funny it, it, when you're watching the games live, there's always like kind of a narrative that t tends to take shape. And there was a lot of focus on like, oh, Jamal Murray is struggling. Oh, Nas Reed had a scoring run in the fourth quarter. Like you focus on these specific things. But I went back and looked through the tape. And uh, as I watched, one of the biggest things that stood out to me is Jokic just didn't play very well. He had seven turnovers. He was completely caught off guard by a lot of like the pressure that Minnesota brought. They were picking him up full court randomly. He had a travel in the backcourt where Nas Reed randomly picked him up in the yeah. full court. There, uh, Rudy Gobert was kind of in his head, kind of stunting, faking like he was going to step up. And then he'd get back and deflect that lob pass to Aaron Gordon. Jokic had a bad night. Anthony Edwards came in and just completely cleaned house. Yeah. And so a lot of times, like I, I look at it and I, it's like, if you're expecting Jamal Murray to just break out against the best perimeter defender in the league in Jaden McDaniels, that's probably not going to happen. That's right. But but Jokic does have the ability to flip the script in the series. He can yeah. be much better. And then one of the big things Michael Malone was talking about after the game, he really didn't like their defensive effort in the second half. And generally, I agree. They yeah, let agree. Ant get they get Ant way, they let Ant get way too comfortable in the mid range when he was isolating those smaller Denver yeah. guards. And he's so dead. He's hitting that fadeaway at like fifty percent. So like yeah. you can't you can't leave him there. You have to get out and like kind of crowd him more. And so I I think a, a better defensive effort to do a better job containing Ant. And then Jokic actually in, inflicting himself on the series as the best player in the world can flip the script. But to your point, it is absolutely an inflection point because if Minnesota wins this series and Ant outplays Jokic, then he just beat the defending champs and the best player in the world without home court advantage and without yeah. a legitimate co-star. I mean, And like, <laughs> if you look, Jason, the, the face of the league right now is really Tatum's personality. It, he really is a giver. He's never a taker. You almost have to push him, nudge him to take. So he doesn't, he looks like to me, he loves being an all-star, making good money and winning games. 
he doesn't have any real agenda to be the face of the league. Uh, Jokic, most of the European guys are not interested. So, like, it's open for Ant. Wemby's not there yet. Jokic isn't interested. You know, Giannis has never really moved the needle in terms of, like, ratings. Embiid's not healthy. So as I'm watching him, first half he was insane. And then and then he was very quiet in the third. But as I'm watching him, I'm like, you know, Jordan had these dead quarters. I mean, Michael was classic for when his head would steam. You're like, okay, Michael's on one. And then Michael Michael really got... He was like a great baseball pitcher that he he knew the 12 pitches he had to get people out. Like Michael knew gear shift. George, uh, LeBron's gotten very good at that. Like LeBron's always hoping his teammates get the game going. And if they don't, then he steps in. And then at the seven minute mark, they get him out. But I watched Ant and I'm like, don't, don't be too critical of him. 25 points in an NBA game and a half is a lot of work. That's a lot of energy. And then in the second half, you're like, uh, first of all, dumb tech talked about that all day but my take was <laughs> my take was kind of like it's there for the taking it feels like denver's not equipped on the bench you know they they could die to have a six man who could play 20 minutes of defense this this may be the moment all these great stars have moments it took jordan years and years the difference is jordan had like iconic teams piston celtics in front of him denver hasn't risen to that so as good as the west is jason it feels like this is the moment to seize it. It's absolutely there for the taking. Again, I I still think Denver is going to win the series. I certainly think it's way too early to just to bail on them entirely. An important element to that game too is they spotted Minnesota an eighteen to four lead. And Michael yeah. Malone talked after the game. Jamal Murray didn't practice all week because of his calf. KCP's got a bad ankle, so uh, like they were they are easing their way into the series in a lot of ways. Also. Generally, uh, just a little brief story. Like I play a lot of pickup basketball, but then during the summer, a lot of the college kids around town and the over guys who play overseas, they come home and I work out with them. And there's always like an adjustment for me going from lower level competition to higher level competition. And there's no doubt that Minnesota is a much higher level defense yeah. than the Lakers were. And so there's going to be a little bit of like, a oh, that pass, I need to put a little more on it. I need yes. to be more accurate. I can't be as sloppy with my handle. This shot that I got off against Austin Reeves, I won't be able to get off against Jaden McDaniels. Like all these, there's going to be an adjustment period for Denver in this series to kind of get used to that offense. That said, as far as Ant goes, like it, it it's, uh, there's still so much room for him to improve because that quiet third quarter, Ant got tired. You could tell Ant got tired in that game. Yes. Thank you to our friends at Panini America, official trading card of uh, our draft coverage here at The Volume and NFT, an official trading card. Uh, listen, whether you're looking for a legendary card or a rookie sensation, Panini America has you covered. They have NFL, WNBA, uh, FIFA, uh, sought after NBA cards. This is what they do. If you're into cutting edge digital collectibles, don't miss Panini's NFT platform at nft.paniniamerica.net. Got that? So you can be a collector of physical cards or a digital enthusiast. Panini America has you covered. They have popular cards from Donruss, Prism, Select, and more. So if you're into trading cards, Panini America is the way to go, especially if you're into digital trading cards. Visit PaniniAmerica.net or download the Panini Direct app today. It's the official trading cards and NFTs of the Colin Cowherd draft coverage. You're into it. They're into you and they deliver. Prism, Don Russ, Select, got them all. All the top cards and more. So there's going to be an energy management piece that he figures yeah. out. There's going to be like a reading the floor better piece that he figures out. There's like, there was a little bully ball possession on Reggie Jackson where he just walked. It was the play. He got the tech. He walked yeah. him right underneath the rim and put it in. It was the easiest bucket he got all night. Like there's going to be a point where he realizes all these guards can't guard him. Right. And, and he starts destroying people even closer to the rim. And so the sky's the limit for him. I got in trouble with Celtics fans uh, for, for comparing the two of them. It was a mailbag question. But then I started thinking about it. I'm like, no, this is this is a real thing here. This is who's the next great American player. 
Yeah. Because there is something to be said about being the best American player in the NBA from a marketability standpoint, right? Sure. Like there's a reason why a huge portion of my listeners are overseas. It's because the best players in the league are all from overseas. And so they've got these huge fan bases from Serbia and, and in the Philippines and things like that. There's all these guys that are that are supporting these players. And we need we need an American star that can come up and kind of take the mantle. And to your point, like Jason Tatum has uh, he just doesn't quite have the personality for it. But the biggest piece and the main reason why I think Ant is better than him has to do with the athleticism piece. Oh yeah. Ant, Ant can have Bradley Beal on the wing and just utterly blow by him off the dribble and then dunk on Kevin Durant like he's not even there. And then it's not to say that Jason Tatum hasn't had big dunks in his career because he's got great size, but his first step is not nearly as dynamic as Anthony Edwards is. And so when he faces a really good defender in a late game situation, he can struggle to get to his spots sometimes. Ant never struggles getting to his spot. Like he's going to get a good look up. It's just a question of whether or not he can make it. And to his credit, the two big things that he's figured out that have been his inflection between the Dominique and MJ kind of like a fork in the road, the, the, the split for him has been, he's been better at reading the floor he was the guy who got Nasri going last night. It was the, the banked in three. That was a kick out from Ant when his man helped. The driving and one on the baseline, that was a skip pass from Ant when he was reading a pick and roll coverage. And then the second piece of it is that jump shooting piece. He is deadly in that 14 to 18 foot range. And so he has a shot he can go to where it's like, this is going to go in a majority of the time. It's it, it gives him like a certain level of resilience in the playoffs. And so I just think, I think he's just better. I think he's the best American player. Well in the league of that generation. And I think he has a chance to take that mantle. Well, to be the best player, it's like being the best country Western star. It, it's not <laughs> just your songs are popular and easy to dance to. There's often something that's, that's it really touches people. If you look at the faces of the league, I don't know if he was a face of a league, but the first player that caught my attention in the seventies was Dr. J. Nobody played like that, right? Nobody played like that, his hand size. And then after that was Magic Johnson. We'd never had a six, eight and a half point guard. And then it was Larry Bird alongside Magic. We'd never had a forward easily be the best shooter and passer in the league. Like he didn't play, he played like a two guard. Um, and then you go into Shaq. Okay, that's, there's nothing been that powerful. Big guys don't run the floor. And then, you know, and before him, it's Michael, um, the greatest player of all time with great flair. Kobe was never really the face of the league, but was like Michael Light. Then you go into LeBron, arguably the greatest player, the great Swiss Army knife that does everything differently. So all those players were like, to some degree, a little bit of unicorns athletically, or they had a dimension to their game. They still show Dr. J's dunk against Michael Cooper. It's still the greatest dunk in league history. <laughs> in a game, it's the 70s. It's 50 years ago with all these athletes. So with Ants, I've watched Jason Tatum live three times. I've watched him a hundred times. He's very good. It's not historically unique looking he's just really clever and really smooth good two-way player ant does stuff and you're like okay it's hard to put the drink down let's uh <laughs> i gotta watch the replay on that like whole even nba guys are like whoa whoa you see him come off the bench so Wemby has some of that Wemby could block eight blocks a game you know i mean he could have a stretch like it, nobody looks like that so i do think ant's advantage is there's a lot of wow stuff i mean i remember when shaq came in the league Jerry Tarkanian, I covered him at UNLV. He told me when Shaq was a sophomore, I was at a place called the late Jerry Tarkanian. I covered him in Vegas at a place called uh, Sharks or Tarks or Sharks. And we were sitting at a bar, me and a guy named John Henderson, a retired sports writer now in Italy. And he said, there's a kid named Shaquille O'Neal at LSU. And he goes, I know you've seen highlights. He's going to be the greatest basketball player you've ever seen when he plays. <laughs> and, you know, Jerry was a very good recruiter. And, you know, and he, he just said, there's never been anything like him. And that's kind of the sentence for the faces of the league. There's never been anything like him. And the, my take is he's a little Dominique, a little Michael. I mean, what's his comp? It feels like the right comps. He's bigger and stronger than the other two guards that came before him too. Like he's got a little bit of like the downhill force that you saw from Dwayne Wade but he's bigger and a better shooter, right? He's yeah. got a lot of, he's got some of the, 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 like the footwork stuff from the mid to high post. But again, like he's, 
he's got like a strength and a power element to his game that even MJ and Kobe didn't have. So like in a weird way, this is the beautiful thing about basketball history is every, every player. It's very rare to have a guy like Kobe. Who's like almost as almost the spitting image of the guy he was trying to be like, right? Like Kobe and MJ were so similar. Ants kind of got his own unique flair on it. It's like, it's like, Dwayne Wade meets better jump shooting meets the body of a middle linebacker in the NFL. Like it's, 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 it's hard, it's hard to describe, but like, and and then again, the big piece of it is like, this guy's going to Kevin Durant and he's like, yeah, you're my favorite player, but you know, I'm busting your ass. Right. Like it's like this weird, like shit talking mixed with respectful mixed with like incredible aggression, but He's also just got this huge personality. And and that to me is a big part of the marketability element where like I could see him being a superstar in the league for decades. You know, I was thinking about this flying in. I, w- I hung out in uh, Park City with my wife this weekend and the dogs and, and uh, it snowed again, by the way, as I was driving to the airport, a snowstorm. It's like May 5th. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking about this that, you know, there's been a lot of instances in my life where a team makes a, a run. Sacramento was like this during the the, the 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 Kobe years where they make a run, they get really close, and you think to yourself, oh, this is going to be like an eight-year run. And then like they have a really bad loss in the playoffs, and they're never the same. I mean, Sacramento, like the beam. I mean, we all felt like this is the beginning of something big. Lose to the Warriors. It just didn't feel the same this year. This, these young teams, Oklahoma City, Minnesota, just jumped over them. Indiana jumped over them. And so, you know, it's, it, it's interesting when I look at the Knicks. You can make the argument, hey, they're going to move Randall. They're going to get somebody in here. It's going to be great. But to get somebody in, they're going to have to get rid of a few Josh Hart's. You got to be very delicate. This is a Tibbs team. (laughs) These veteran guys, they don't want to practice like that. They don't want to play 45 minutes. So the Knicks are fascinating. I thought Philadelphia would win this series. And by the middle of game two, I'm like, oh, yeah, New York's a better team. They're winning the boards. They're better late. They're better coached. It just it just felt like, you know, you watch series and you're like, oh, by the way, we may feel this by halftime of Minnesota-Denver. You know, you're like, oh, there's a real problem here. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting with the Knicks, I can also argue this. Jimmy Butler was hurt. Both Dame and Giannis were hurt. Sixers have a shit ton of cap space and three potential picks. Indiana's getting better. What if Orlando takes a big swing and gets a member of the Phoenix Suns, right? Like, do you buy, because you're going to have to give up some of those nice, maybe a Villanova guy. They're such a hustle effort team. Is this, like, you can't take it for granted. The the, the East this year stinks. Like, its depth is all-time bad. Do we both believe, hey, they're just going to add a KD or Paul George, and they're going to take a leap? Or is it a delicate ecosystem there in New York and a beat up Eastern conference and reality may smack him in the face next year. So a huge part of their identity right now is the hustle, right? Oh, like, yeah. I, I, yeah, like they, like the, their offense kind of reminds me of like the Allen Iverson 76ers teams where Jalen Brunson is kind of just totally taking that responsibility on by, by himself, but it's mixed with like, Hey, as soon as Jalen shoots, just everyone crash the offensive glass and go go get the rebound. Like that's basically what it is. And it's like Isaiah Hartenstein, excellent offensive rebounder. Mitchell Robinson, excellent offensive rebounder. Josh Hart, excellent offensive rebounder. Dante DiVincenzo, excellent offensive rebounder. And that's just kind of what they do. So the, the thing though is like, you have to be careful if you include somebody like OG Ananobi in a trade like that, because the physical profile of the Knicks is vitally important in my opinion. And I think you can get away with giving up, you know, for instance, like I think if I had to choose between giving up Hart and DiVincenzo in a deal or an OG and an OB, I would be doing whatever I could to hold on to OG. Because yeah. if you get if you get Kevin Durant at this phase of his career older, right, and he's not as like physically strong as a guy like OG and an OB, you alter you alter the the physical profile of the team to the point where you're not as imposing. Because OG is a big part of what you're capable of doing on both ends of the floor in terms of that physical identity. And so I think they have to be careful. The You're going to fundamentally change your identity as a basketball team by making a deal like that because you go from being the bully, offensive rebound, out-hustle team to now we're a classic two-star build built on offensive firepower and in a little bit more of that uh, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, 
overall offensive skill. So you got to find a way to kind of toe that line between the two because you don't want to lose that toughness identity because that toughness identity is a huge part of how you're winning. Right. But I think if they could somehow pull in a legitimate scoring forward, someone like a Paul George or Kevin Durant without giving up that uh, that OG and an OB slot, I think you right. could be in good shape. This is where it's an advantage that you have the picks that you have and that you have as many good players as you have. Because yeah. if you had to give up a, a, a Mitchell Robinson, you have Isaiah Hartenstein. If you have to give up an Isaiah Hartenstein, you have Mitchell Robinson. If you have to give up a Dante DiVincenzo, you know who's a hell of a player? Deuce McBride. Like yeah. that, and he's a guy that can guard on the perimeter and do a lot of that stuff. So like they have enough depth to where they can give up from different spots. But but if I'm Phoenix and you're like, you want Kevin Durant, I'm like, I want OG Ananobi. And so it's going to be tough. It's going to be a hard negotiation. Yep. But if they can somehow keep Jalen, OG, one of the centers, and then get one of those big forwards, that's a really good team. That's a, that's a team that you'd be probably picking out east. Well, and in, in you live in Arizona, and we've talked about this, is that you can get more for Booker. Uh, but remember, Phoenix was not good pre-Chris Paul, so he's not a leader guy. And he can't carry a franchise. And then you disappointed this year with Durant and Beal around Booker. Booker's your classic, um, you know, catch shoot. It, 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 I don't think he's a great athlete. He's just a he's a dependable 25, 26 a night. He can be really streaky and get into the 35 for long stretches. Like he's a crazy streak shooter. Um, but I, I think you make the mistake if you like in Orlando, if Orlando made a move. Boncaro's your one to me, it feels like. And Booker comes in as a, as a really good two, but I want another score at the forward, you know, another, some size, some length. So like if you're Phoenix, now Beal and Kevin Durant, well, if you get rid of Booker, I got to get some young players over here because those guys are going to miss some spots. Although Durant played a ton this year. So my take is it, you're, you're Phoenix. You can bring it all back, but there are issues. You don't have a classic point guard. You don't have much of a bench. So those are real issues. You can keep bringing stuff back, but it's like at some point you have holes, right? We see like Milwaukee, you can bring it all back and they may have to because they don't have they don't have a lot of assets and this is an old roster. They're all locked up. I don't think that many people want. I think Dame, you could move in Giannis, but they don't want to move those two. So my takeaway is you watch a lot of Suns basketball. Who would you move? Where would you move them? Because it feels like to me, people are going to make, they're going to get more phone calls than any team in the league. Because there's a lot of New York Knicks and Orlando's out there looking at Phoenix thinking it ended poorly. You know, they 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 want to get out of stuff. They don't want to say it publicly. Phoenix is saying, hey, we're bringing the band back together. But it's a flawed team. Bogle likes mm. bigs. They don't, it's not built for him. What would you do? But you have to say that too. You can't be like, yeah, oh yeah, fire sale this summer. <laughs> you come and get them. But like the as far as far as I'm concerned, so much of this comes down to how you view Booker. And a lot of Suns fans view him as like a bona fide franchise cornerstone. Yeah. And the point, the thing they point to there is the 2021 season. But it's like, okay, hold on a second. Let's let's filter through that. The conference finalists out west was a team led by Paul George. Okay, without without Kawhi Leonard. And uh, Trey Young made the conference finals out East. Like it was, it, they won, the Bucks won that series with Giannis had a hyperextended knee over the last couple of games. So like it, really that was the weird COVID season where all yeah. the good teams got hurt. Yes. All the good teams got hurt. The Lakers got hurt. The Nuggets got hurt. The Miami Heat got hurt. Like everyone was yep. hurt in that season. So like, it was kind of this gap year, totally legitimate championship for the Bucks, but like the Suns getting to the finals, I think, got them to believe in Devin Booker as this like franchise yeah. cornerstone. I look at Devin Booker more as like the Kyrie Irving type of archetype. If I could put him next to a real a franchise player and he can just focus on being a late game shot maker slash guy that can spell your star for yeah. stretches and run the offense, that's the kind of fit that I like. And so when I look at the Sun situation, Bradley Beal, I think, is a really good player, but his trade value is low because he's older, injury prone, yeah. and on a long term deal that pays him a shit ton of money, right? Yeah. Kevin Durant, really good player, but old uh, and, and just in a situation where like he doesn't have as much value around the league. Devin Booker is a guy that you can trade and get a haul. Oh. And so, yeah. And so, what I was pitching is like, embrace, like, have the self awareness to embrace the fact that Devin Booker is not going to be your franchise cornerstone and then be like, okay, well, how do we turn this situation into something more fun? I would call Orlando and I'd be like, Hey, you got Dev, you got Paolo Boncaro, but you just lost a series to the Cavs because nobody can create a shot other than Paolo and no one can make jumpers. So like you need somebody that can come in and just be like a skill guard next to Paolo, Paolo Boncaro. And so if I would call them and I'd be like, I want Jalen Suggs. I want Jonathan Isaac. 
And I want Wendell Carter Jr. That's a lot. That is a haul. Those are three really good. Hey, Suggs young was viewed players. as a bust six months ago. Exactly. And, and to Suggs' credit, he's turned himself into one of the best perimeter defenders in the league and a good three point shooter, right? Like he's a very valuable archetype. So now if I'm the Suns, I'm looking at it. And by the way, you might be able to even coax Orlando into throwing you a draft pick or two in that deal. Who, who knows, depending on how that yeah. conversation would go. But then I look at it and I'm like, okay, now I've got. I've got Jalen Suggs, an elite point of attack defender, something Phoenix did not have last year. I've got Bradley Beal still, still a high-powered number two. I've got Kevin Durant and Jonathan Isaac, two really rangy, long wings that can do a lot defensively. And I'm going from Yusuf Nurkic, an old, uh, a slow-footed big center, to Wendell Carter Jr., who is a big, strong, athletic young center who can shoot the three ball. And so it kind of creates like a more fun Phoenix Suns team and it's just an acknowledgement of the reality that you weren't going to be able to rebuild around Booker and then go into these series with him as the best player. Because like, if you go into a series with Devin Booker as your best player it, or into a playoff run, you're going to run into a lot of teams that have better players than Devin Booker. You just are. And, yeah. and so that's that problem's not going away. And if I'm Orlando, I'm looking at it like, Paolo is a franchise cornerstone. Yes. But clearly this, clearly this build where it's like we're big and strong and athletic, but nobody can shoot, no one can dribble, no yeah, one they can pass. can't shoot. That, that, that's not working either. And so I look at that as like, we'll figure out the rest later. Give me Devin Booker at age 27 yep. next to next to my young star who yep. just averaged 27 points per game in a seven-game series against an elite defense when no one else on his team could make anything and he had to do everything. It was a really impressive series from Powell. And he's got a lot of that like physical imposition on the game that is super valuable. Yeah, no, that it's a really interesting trade because I think... I mean, I think what Orlando could provide is what Phoenix needs. And I just, I thought it was going to be better, but the more I watched Phoenix and I watched them a lot, I'm like, yep, too much duplication. Doesn't work. Need more size. Need a better wing defender. They just got to make moves. Yeah, I've said this all the time in the NFL. It's okay to make mistakes. Just don't double down on them. Don't convince mm. yourself Daniel Jones of the Giants is a top 10 quarterback. That's the mistake. <laughs> Not saying, hey, we missed it on draft pick. Everybody misses on draft picks. So uh, one of the things... <clears throat> I want to talk about Darvin Ham for a second because I, I I said this the other day. Listen, is for years and years you'd hear Warrior fans banging on Steve Kerr. Where's Kaminga? Where's Wiseman? Well, they run a sophisticated offense that's lightning speed, and to bring guys out of the G League high school, insert them when you're trying to, by the way, refine them as players. They're just raw. I mean, you're just sandpapering these players. Oh yeah, and learn this offense. Playing with Steph Curry and Draymond Green is that's that's calculus. That, that, that's not you're not talking about Orlando's offense, right? They all got they're all growing together. So people banged on Kerr for years about you're not getting the young guys in, and it's like Steve knows what he's doing. He sees the film. He's at practice every day. Give him credit. Um, and I don't think Darvin Ham, as a rookie head coach, is at that level. But but where I'll defend him is that like when you faced. Denver. Denver's won 12 or 13 times. If you win 12 out of 13 games in a baseball series, you know, Yankees have owned the Twins forever. There's probably a reason. Your back end's bad. You don't have the power. The, there, there's something. There, you're, you're, you're missing a component. You know, the Yankees have better starting pitching, whatever it is. And I look at Denver and the Lakers, and the four best players for the Nuggets never really have a terrible game. Like, Murray can play like crap in the first half, but he'll have a great fourth. Porter will eventually hit big shots. Even KCP rarely is bad for four quarters. But Rui can disappear. D'Lo has disappeared. Um, Anthony Davis, because he works so darn hard on the defensive end, sometimes, you know, sort of regresses offensively late. And so I look at it and I think, well, God, I watched the Lakers led for 70% of it, but they just have guys in their rotation that disappear. And then Anthony and LeBron have to literally like play harder minutes, more minutes. So I, I look at it and I think to myself, you got to get out of substitution patterns. We're not at practice. Who does he trust? Who doesn't he? I'd bring Darvin Ham back. But I mean, Laker fans are a hundred percent that he's a bum, uh, that he can't coach. And I'm like, am I missing something? Is he that bad of a coach? So he shouldn't have been put in this particular situation, which is where everything really comes back to the front office. A Darvin Ham should be, should have been given a situation where he could kind of learn how to coach on the fly without as much pressure as there was in Los Angeles. The 
to be clear, and, and, I, and I heard your opening rant the day after Darvin Ham got fired, and I totally agree with everything you said. So many teams rush to blame the coach. It's actually one of my biggest pet peeves in the NBA. Every fan base hates their coach. It's the craziest Everyone. thing. Everyone. The Warriors, the Warriors, I've even seen Heat fans complain about Spolstra's rotation. Like it is a it is a super common thing around the league. So I want to be clear. The Lakers lost to Denver because their players weren't as good as Denver's players. Right. That 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 goes that that is it is that is absolutely what happened in that series. I actually thought it was super fascinating that coming into that season, you and I talked about how like, hey, Rui plays the same position as LeBron, D'Lo plays the same position as Austin. Those are redundancies. They need to trade those guys. And yes. who, were, who were the two guys that let them down in that series? Rui and D'Lo. Like those yep. were the two guys. So you like that like the front office is why they lost to Denver. That said. It became abundantly clear this season that Darwin was not ready. And there, there are two main things that I want to hit on, and I'll, and I'll be quick. One, he grossly mismanaged the talent on the roster. Here's the basic stat that will send this point home. In the 13-game stretch after the in-season tournament, when they went 3-10, and 10, which yeah. is literally the reason they had to play Denver yeah. in the first round and fight through the play-in tournament, D'Angelo Russell, who, as, as flawed as he is, is certainly their third or fourth best player, D'Angelo Russell was playing as many minutes as Cam Reddish and taking as many shots as Torian Prince. That was what was happening in that 13-game stretch post-in-season tournament. So he got in a doghouse. Yeah, when you are playing... And and here's the thing. I understand when there's like a sixth or seventh man in your rotation that's struggling and you need to jockey the rotation around. Because Darvin said he leaked to the press like when a guy... Well, what's the word you phrase you use? Shits the bed 10 games in a row. You got to do yeah. something. Here's the problem, though. What you don't do is go, hmm, Derek White, that was a rough 10 game stretch. You know what? Let's take him out of the lineup. Let's put Peyton Pritchard in there. Like, that's not what you do. Like, you, you play your best players. Your best players get more leeway. You don't pull D'Angelo Russell and heavily limit his usage in, in, in minute uh, opportunities on the floor for Cam Reddish. Who literally is what on his fourth team in five years? It, like it, it just it was an asinine uh, misallocation of resources, and it directly led to the situation they were in in the standings. Everybody knew their five best players were LeBron, AD, Austin, D'Lo, Rui. As soon as he started playing all five of them big minutes and starting, they took off and won most of their games. That that was that was a gross uh, that was a negligent management of talent, right? The second piece of it, and the important part to understand here, is the context of why he got hired. Right around the time Darvin got hired, who was the big coach that everybody wanted after the situation? What happened in Boston? It was Ime Udoka. Everyone's like, man, Ime Udoka took the Celtics and turned them from like kind of a soft group into like a really tough group in that 2021 season, remember? And so there was all of this like, or 2022 season, I should say. Basically what people were thinking was, let's get a former player who can like look eye to eye with these guys and hold them accountable. And the main issue that Darvin Ham had, and I would say this was a bigger issue than anything having to do with the rotation, he was too much of a benevolent motivator. He never held those guys accountable on a day-to-day basis. They'd have games which would have unacceptable efforts, and then he'd go and be like, you know, marathon, not a sprint. You know, we're just we're just in this right. for the long haul. This is all going to be fine. And when you watch, I was it was jarring in that Denver series to watch the juxtaposition of Michael Malone actively coaching on the sideline. Guy makes a mistake. It's a timeout. He's getting screamed at in the huddle. There he's. Going he after game four, he went and ripped them all a new one in the post game presser for not protecting the paint two games in a row. It, and then Darvin Ham is just sitting chilling on the sideline. He's a very passive coach, and he never held players accountable. And so when you look at those two teams, I've got a Denver team that is really sharp in their execution. They never let go of the rope for more than a possession or two before they regain composure. And there was a Lakers team that would frequently lose control of the situation for like three four minutes at a time. There were a lot of big defensive mistakes down the stretch in those losses, the, the the buzzer beater ones in game two and in game five. And so the reality is, is like Darvin's not responsible for what happened. However, everyone involved in that situation knew like, hey, Darvin's not a very good NBA coach right now. So yeah. we have a lot of urgency. We have a lot of pressure. LeBron's going into year 22. He's going to be 40 years old. Let's not head into this season at a coaching disadvantage. Let's get someone in here that's more established, someone that can actually have a higher floor, a baseline level of competence, so that we actually make sure that the players are the one determining the outcome here at the end of the day. The NBA playoffs are heating up. Man, they have been so good. I know it's over, but Lakers-Nuggets may have been a five-game series. It was great. 
Knicks, Sixers, amazing. Why don't you sign up for the DraftKings Sportsbook app? It takes 90 seconds. The official sports betting partner of the NBA. If you're in DraftKings, once you sign up, you got to check this out. New customers bet five bucks to get 150 bucks in bonus bets instantly. Great proposition, right? Five bucks, you get 150 bucks. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. The code's Colin, C O L I N. It's me, C O L I N. Really quick, really easy. If you've never bet sports before, check it out. Really makes the games fun. The code is Colin. New customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets by betting five only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. It, it's really interesting. And you see this in all sports where, you know, somebody struggles in postseason. Uh, Dak Prescott has multiple times. He's still going to get paid in the NFL. It's not like it doesn't happen in the NFL. But it is interesting. In the NFL, if you can't stay healthy and you're always hurt at the end of the year, teams move off you uh, because they can move off you. NBA teams, it's not that easy, right? There's The contracts have to match. It's harder to trade really good players in the NBA. But I, I, it, the Clippers remind me of the friend who's fun to hang out with, but if you ever call them to go to the airport or the hospital, they just don't show up. Like, <laughs> it's the same. I mean, I never know if Kawhi's playing. Harden and Westbrook scare me to death in the postseason. I think Paul George is underrated. But I, as I watch them again, is I feel like the Clippers sort of deserve this. Like, they re-signed Kawhi. Most teams were like, no, like we're, we're out. It's one thing if you're injured, Jason. It's another if you're nonverbal. And I mean, I've, you're not sure at 345 as a head coach if he's going to be in the mood to play. That's why Popovich just said, I'm out. I'm done. I want to feel bad for teams that get eliminated due to injuries, but I'm kind of over the Clippers. I mean, is that unfair? No, not at all. I mean, the, the in the weeks leading up to the first round series, we didn't know whether or not he was going to play. Neither did the neither did the Clippers staff. Like those questions to Ty Lue, he's like, I don't know, we'll see. I don't know, we'll see. Like he, he just he just doesn't know, right? And honestly, I I feel bad because uh, I, if you're a Clippers fan, I don't even have any sort of advice or any sort of like situation that 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 would lead you to have an optimistic perspective moving forward. I understand why you'd run it back next season in particular, because brand new arena, you can't go into the brand new arena with a rebuilding situation. Right. And I thought one of one of the specific things that this shined a light on is. Paul George and Kawhi or Paul George and James Harden is not enough either. It's been one of the biggest things that stood out to me from this postseason run. The the stars that have real physical gifts, and I mean like a superpower of some kind in terms of their physical advantages, they are thriving. But the ones that are relying almost solely on skill are really struggling. And I thought that that Maverick series was a perfect example of that. Luca's big. He's just bigger and stronger than the vast yeah. majority of the guys he's going against. So he can get a little bit of an angle, shoot that gap, bump you with his left shoulder and get to a little short shot in the lane that he yeah. can make at a high percentage. And that's how Luca got going in that series was closer to the basket. His pull-up jumper was broke that entire series. Kyrie Irving, he has an elite first step. He's super quick. And that in conjunction with him, his skill allows him to get open. J uh, James Harden is just a better version of D'Angelo Russell. He's a skill guard that can't really shake free from people, right? And and uh, Paul George at this phase in his career is a tall, you know, kind of like not overly quick, not overly fast skill wing. And so when you put elite defenders on them that bring physicality, they struggle to beat people off the dribble. They struggle to get separation. Whereas the top tier guys were, we're watching Anthony Edwards just cut everybody to pieces. We're watching Jokic get wherever he wants. We're watching Luka get wherever he wants. We're watching the elite athletes thrive. And so the problem is for the Clippers, Kawhi is their elite athlete. He's the one guy that has the yeah. resilience to get to his spots in the postseason. And here we are, what, four four seasons in a row where he's not able to finish this grind. And so yeah. I don't I don't know where you go from here, but at a certain point, I think they have to give it one more shot just because of the new arena. But I think if it goes south next year, you have no choice but to do something. Yeah, and I also think you have to take into consideration that Ty Lue's considered an elite coach. So, like, if Ty Lue can't figure out the Rubik's Cube, but what's the what, what would a Darvin Ham or a middling coach do like one of the <laughs> best coaches is like, yeah, I can't figure it out. But it, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I will say this is that, you know, a lot of people after Kyrie's performance in the series are pushing back and saying, well, Hey, you guys all bailed on him. No, 
Nobody bailed on their belief he's the greatest small closer with both hands we've ever seen. Nobody bailed on that, right? Like, I still contend that, that you know, Baker Mayfield's one of the top 20 quarterbacks in the world, like today. I think he's a really good quarterback. We just had pushback on some of the, you know, early behavior, maturation. Nobody denies that. And with Kyrie, my takeaway, it is working now. Um, and Luke is obviously great. But I do think, and I think we talked about this last time, I think they're too lopsided to win a title. Like, when they win, it's always spectacular. Sometimes you have to win boring. Sometimes you just have to, like, Denver has mastered winning boring, trailing most of the game. The other night, I, I had this feeling when it was, they were down two or three with about five minutes to go. I'm like, oh, God, this is just such a Denver game. But, you know, Minnesota is a different task now. But I, I tend to think teams that need spectacular, and Kyrie's spectacular. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of easy mid range stuff. It's all beautiful. Do you consider them? Do you consider them a title contender in Dallas? You know, I pretty much did until the Maxi Kleba injury. Maxi Kleba is is vitally important to a specific look that they have, which is their small ball look. When they have Kleba and PJ Washington at the four and the five next to Derek Jones Jr., Kawhi, or excuse me, Kyrie and Luka Doncic, they're very versatile defensively. To your point, like everyone's focused on Kyrie and Luka. Everyone knew Kyrie and Luka could do what they could do. The reason right. why Dallas is succeeding is they had a veteran minimum signing in Derek Jones Jr., who, who is a absolute home run. Like he's just giving them excellent point of attack defense. He was the guy who guarded Paul George so well in the last series. And he's hitting spot up shots and can drive closeouts and can run his lane in transition. And then PJ Washington and Maxi Kleba give them these really versatile defensive forwards that can defend at the rim and out on the perimeter. Specifically for the OKC matchup, it's tricky because Chet Holmgren is a is a big man who can shoot. And specifically, he'll set screens and then pop to the three-point line. That is a nightmare for drop coverage bigs like Derek Lively, like Daniel Gafford. So Maxi Kleba was the was the remedy for that. Maxi Kleba was the guy who could switch those screens. Maxi Kleba can actually slide his feet and guard Shea Gilgis Alexander a little bit. So you can switch those screens and things like that. He was a vital part of their defensive versatility. His injury is a massive loss for that team. I don't want to cut them uh, cut them out entirely from this picture because anybody who's made it to the second round certainly has a shot. But that yeah. that Kleba that Kleba hit is a big loss for them. All right, Caitlin Clark topic. So, and this is just off the top of my head, but if you look at players who have missed, and I don't watch enough WNBA to have a strong opinion, but if you look at basketball in general on players that miss college to pro, uh, it, it it's a lot of bigs, a lot of injury issues. Sometimes bigs come into the league and they just they just they're a little old school. It's new school. They get pushed around. Teammates, coaches lose confidence. Generally, point guards. I mean. I mean, listen, if you're quick, if you distribute, you can shoot a little bit. It's hard to bust. You, you can find a space for a guy maybe in rotation. So, and I always feel that way with shooters. If you're quick and you can get a good shot and you can shoot, the, 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 the league's just need. It's not a lot of guys that can really shoot that have been busts. They'll find a way. Even if you're an awful defensive player, they'll bring you off the bench. They'll put you in patterns so you're not having to guard the best defensive players. So like Caitlin Clark, there's this sense is, oh, she's going to be a can't miss. Well, even in the NFL, there is no can't miss. There are no can't misses. My take on her, though, is she is really quick. She has tremendous court awareness. So players are going to like playing with her. Like at Iowa, you know, she makes great passes. People can't finish. Like people now can finish in the WNBA. So and also she just she gets a shot and she's a devastating shooter. So I do see her transforming the league. I don't think we've seen a shooter like that in the league. And I also think, again, her court awareness, playing with better finishers, people are going to want to play with her. Like Even if she struggles, she'll get other people involved and she'll draw so much attention. What is your guess on what kind of player she is? Is she a, is she a first team all WNBA? I, 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 because I just don't, I don't have, you know, the length is much different in the WNBA. Like six, 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 seven is is everybody's got those level players. So you don't get the freebies down low. You know, in college, you can get some real cheap baskets, men's and women's. I think she's gonna be a star, but I have no nothing to judge it on. I mean, you're I mean, Cheryl Miller was bigger, taller. I mean, there's certain times you look at athletes and you just go, Candace Parker, that's gonna work. But a shooting guard from Iowa, I don't know. What do we make of it? So 
I, I actually view the college game as more challenging to score than people think. And there, there's a bunch of reasons for that. One, like, look at that Iowa team. There are a lot of girls on that team that could shoot, right? So, like, the spacing isn't as good. One of the things that's interesting to me about college hoops is the athleticism is always much further along than the offensive skill development. So, like, it's actually, like, a lot of – and then the coaching is really good and the level of intensity on a game-to-game basis is really, really high. So, it's actually really difficult to score at the college level. And to your – I actually 100% agree with you on your take on, like – the the safety of a player like the the like a an offensively skilled player being kind of bust proof in the yeah. sense that like the 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 vast majority of players that demonstrated they could score at the college level get into the NBA and they're able to score and it's because Jimmer usually... Ferdet was a very small player by mm-hmm. NBA standards she's not I mean so there are people that just can't defend it all she's not small she she's not you know. Caitlin's got some size to her as well. Like you're not going to push her around either. She's a feisty player. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I, I thought that was one of the first things that it, it, first of all, such a statement to me about just the type of phenomenon that Caitlin Clark is that like, I was covering a game that day. I think it was, I think it was the, the, um, it might've been the the Nuggets Wolves game. I can't remember. I was watching a game for, for my job that day. And I literally got my phone up and downloaded the WNBA app. And I watched it. I was like, I texted my wife. My wife was at the airport flying home from Chicago. And I texted her and I was like, Hey, like Caitlin Clark's playing on the WNBA app right now. And she stopped everything she was doing and she downloaded the app and she watched the game, which just goes to show you the, yeah. the t- like the type of phenomenon that she is. But like, as I was watching, like she can get separation yes. from these girls. Yes. And in, ad- in addition to that, like, Everyone always focuses on like, oh, the athleticism goes up a level. All this gets more difficult, but basketball doesn't work like that. You're not just playing one-on-one all game long. Like you're running sets, you're doing things that are designed to generate openings. And she has the skill to make shots in those openings. And so there was, it was such a, I don't know what it is about Caitlin and maybe it is her fame, but there seems to be this like segment that's almost like rooting for her to fail. Yeah, it's kind of it. it's kind of bizarre to me. I, I I don't understand it. But the truth of the matter is, is like she might have certain matchups. Like she might run into specific defenders at the yeah. WNBA that give her some issues. She's gonna have off shooting nights. She's gonna have because she's new at this. She's gonna have stretches where it doesn't look as pretty. But to me, it's a pretty safe bet that she's gonna score a lot of baskets in the WNBA for a long time. Yeah, and I do think she has a unique ability. Um, I'm interested in WNBA. And WNBA basketball now. And I, you know, be the first to tell you, I don't watch everything. I don't watch NASCAR. Uh, I do watch playoff hockey, but I don't watch a lot of regular season hockey. I don't watch WNBA much. If it's on, I'd watch 10 minutes of it, but it's like, oh yeah, I'll watch. Like I would never, uh, uh, you know, I don't do a ton of country music, but there have been acts over time. I'd be like, oh, I'd go to watch that. And I think she has that. Oh, I'd watch that. You bring the casual in. I can't, KD always, you know, you're a casual. Well, most people are casuals. I mean, the truth is the reason the NFL, I've said for years, the NFL is lasagna or Italian food. It's everybody's <laughs> second favorite, if not first. NBA is more sushi. You love it or you don't like it at all. I went to college with guys from Palouse country in Washington state, raw fish to them. <laughs> it's like not a chance in the world. So like every sport needs casuals and the NFL just has a ton of casuals. My, my wife would sit down and watch an NFL game. You're not going to watch baseball. She not. You know, so I, I think Caitlin Clark has the ability to pull me in. I feel it. And I think it's great. All right. Jason Timp hoops tonight as always great stuff. Yeah, this was fun, man. Looking forward to it. This second round is going to be incredible. These two Western conference series are going to be, are going to be barn burners. I'm looking forward to breaking it down with you.